So we've seen that a key idea of physical equilibrium is that if we have two phases inside a closed system, like a liquid and vapor for the same substance, such that the free energy of the vapor is not equal to the free energy of the liquid, then spontaneous phase transitions will occur until these two free energies are equal, such that delta G for evaporation and condensation are both zero. So in the equilibrium state, the free energy of the vapor is equal to the free energy of the liquid. And at the end of the last video, we noticed something strange about the temperature dependence of the vapor pressure, the pressure of the vapor phase. All of these free energies depend on temperature. And our goal in this video is to make this dependence a little more clear and understand why an increase in temperature causes an increase in the number of moles of vapor molecules and not just their kinetic energy as we would expect according to the ideal gas law. So let's imagine we started with a hypothetical closed system containing 10 moles of liquid, which I've drawn here as black circles at the bottom of the system, and 3 moles of vapor, which I've drawn as blue circles bouncing around in the headspace above the liquid. We can write free energies for each of these phases using the molar free energy of each phase. So the total free energy, for example, of the liquid is equal to the number of moles of liquid times its molar or per mole free energy. We can do the same thing for the vapor phase. G for the vapor phase or the gas phase is equal to the number of moles of gas times the molar free energy of the gas. In this case, these numbers of moles we can read directly from the system. Let's imagine that this system is currently at physical equilibrium such that the total free energies are equal to each other. The free energy of the gas is equal to the free energy of the liquid but we increase the temperature. What we want to know is what happens to the system as a result of this temperature increase. In other words, what are the numbers of moles of liquid and gas at the end of this temperature increase? From our discussion last time, it should be intuitive that the number of moles of gas is going to increase due to the temperature increase. But we want to understand why this is by fleshing out these free energy expressions a little bit more. Note that we can write each molar free energy in terms of enthalpies and entropies. So the molar free energy of the gas, for example, is equal to the molar enthalpy of the gas minus T times the entropy of the gas. That is the molar entropy of the gas. And the molar free energy of the liquid phase is equal to the molar enthalpy of the liquid phase minus the temperature times the molar entropy of the liquid phase. Note that these molar free energies are not necessarily equal to one another because the moles of gas and liquid can adjust such that the total free energies are still equal even if the molar free energies of the two phases are not. And in general, the molar free energies of two phases of the same substance will not be equal in particular for two reasons. One, because the entropies will be different. The entropy of a gas is very different from the entropy of a liquid. And two, because the enthalpies will likely be different. The intermolecular forces involved in a gas will be minimal compared to the intermolecular forces in a liquid. To keep things simple, let's consider all the enthalpies to be zero and only think about the entropy dependence of these free energies. If we think about our intuitions for entropy, which phase will have the higher entropy, the gas or the liquid? Think about this for a second. Hopefully you came to the conclusion that the molar entropy of the gas will be much, much greater than the molar entropy of the liquid phase. This is because it's a more dispersed phase or a less condensed phase. The gas is much more dispersed than the liquid. As the temperature increases, what happens to the free energy of each phase? Let's look at this on a graph. Let's put temperature on the x-axis and the molar free energy of either the gas or the liquid on the y-axis. Because the entropy of the gas phase is much greater than the entropy of the liquid phase, the free energy of the gas phase will be much lower than the free energy of the liquid phase, ignoring the influence of enthalpy. More important is to understand what happens when we increase the temperature. An increase in temperature is going to cause a decrease in free energy since both entropies are positive. So for example, the liquid phase is going to go down in free energy with an increase in temperature. However, the factor multiplying the temperature in the free energy of the gas is much greater. That is, the entropy of the gas 
on a per mole basis is much greater than the entropy of the liquid, so the free energy of the gas phase will decrease much more rapidly than the free energy of the liquid phase will, and will get consequently a much larger delta G, or difference in free energy, at a higher temperature. This leads to more moles of gas appearing after an increase in temperature. So maybe we'll have something like five moles of gas now and only five moles of liquid in a new equilibrium state at a higher temperature. The origin of that effect is really this larger decrease in free energy, which we can trace ultimately to the larger molar entropy of the gas relative to the liquid. The molar free energy of the vapor or gas phase decreases with temperature much more rapidly than the molar free energy of the liquid phase. The only way for equilibrium to be re-established with this larger difference between the free energies is for more moles of gas to form. So with an increase in temperature, we get an increase in the moles of gas and a decrease in the moles of liquid such that when it's all said and done, in the new final state, the moles of liquid times the new molar free energy, which I'll denote just with a prime symbol, is still equal to the moles of gas times the new gaseous molar free energy. And I really want to emphasize, I really want you to appreciate that the origin of this effect can really be traced back to the difference in entropies between the two phases. And the fact that the gaseous phase has a much, much larger molar entropy than the liquid phase. If we have these molar enthalpies and molar entropies in hand, we can actually calculate exactly how the free energies are affected by a change in temperature, and calculate exactly how many moles of vapor will form as a result of, say, an increase in temperature. And the resulting pressure, of course, can be calculated from this number of moles using the ideal gas law. This was done by Clausius back in the day, and the resulting equation that shows us how the vapor pressure changes with temperature is known as the Clausius Clapeyron equation. And here it is. It says that the natural log of P1 over P2, the natural log of the pressure in state 1 divided by the pressure in state 2, is equal to the difference in molar enthalpies for the vapor and liquid phase. This is just delta H of vaporization for the substance, right? Divided by R times 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2. This is a pretty useful equation because provided we know the vapor pressure at one temperature, and the delta H of vaporization, we can calculate the vapor pressure at any other temperature. This is also useful because we can measure the vapor pressure at T1 and the vapor pressure at T2, and from that calculate the delta H of vaporization. There's quite a bit of empirical support for the clausius clapeyron equation as well. What you're seeing are experimental vapor pressures for different substances as the points, and the lines are the theoretical fit, the clausius clapeyron fit. The speed with which these curves increase is related to delta H of vaporization. Since there's a negative sign here, a large delta H is going to correspond to a slow increase in vapor pressure with temperature. Water has a very, very high heat of vaporization, and we'll talk about why that is actually here in a couple of videos. Notice that this translates into a very slow increase in vapor pressure with temperature relative to something like ethanol or diethyl ether, which have much lower enthalpies of vaporization. So we've seen that vapor pressure increases with temperature according to the clausius clapeyron equation. At some temperature, the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the pressure of the surroundings, the pressure that the surroundings is applying on the chemical system. The temperature at which this obtains is called the boiling point. To find the boiling point on a clausius clapeyron graph like this, we only need to look at atmospheric pressure, which is about 760 millimeters of mercury, and see where we are on temperature, and that's about here. Notice that waters shows up right where we would expect it, at about 100 C. The boiling point of ethanol is lower, it's around 78 to 80 C, and the boiling point of diethyl ether is much lower, it's only around 35 C. The boiling point is the temperature at which the vapor pressure is equal to one atmosphere. As we alluded to before, if we know the boiling point at, say, atmospheric pressure, we can calculate the boiling point at any other pressure using the clausius clapeyron equation. We just plug that new pressure into the equation, plug in atmospheric pressure and the normal boiling point, and then solve for T sub B2, the new boiling point that we want to know. 
One thing to note about this is that at temperatures above the boiling point, complete vaporization of the liquid is spontaneous because the vapor will constantly push against the surroundings. If we have a liquid whose temperature is greater than Tb, the pressure exerted by the vapor molecules is greater than the pressure exerted by the atmosphere. And so complete vaporization becomes spontaneous at that point. To close this video, let's return to this graph of vapor pressure as a function of temperature. There are considerable differences in boiling points for the three compounds shown here. And as chemists, we want to appreciate what the molecular origin of these differences in boiling points is. We think about the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. The pressure and temperature terms just kind of are what they are. And if we're thinking of these substances as ideal, then some of this has to do with the ideal gas law, right? The pressures and temperatures don't necessarily depend on molecular identity. The only piece of this equation that might be different for different substances is delta H, the enthalpy of vaporization. And we already alluded to the fact that the larger delta H is, the slower is the increase of vapor pressure with temperature. So what we really want to appreciate then is the molecular origin of delta H of vaporization. What causes on the molecular level water to have a larger enthalpy of vaporization than say diethyl ether? 